Patsy? All right, so we have a look now. And this we did, remember? Remember about um, the change? Which one's more common? Um, that's called genetic drift. Light one more common when there's uh, glycan on the forest. Dark one more common, the melanic one more common when there is soot on the trees. Genetic drift. But they can still breed, they're still one species. Okay. Alright. Go past all of this. Artificial selection we did. I still want to look up who in who in King Darwin and I really thought that it was his, his uncle or his grandfather that bred pigeons. But that's not that's not the issue. They're not going to ask you that. It's still we still get to the same um, why did he use um, artificial selection to come how you know to come up with his idea of natural selection. It doesn't matter who in King Darwin. I mean, nothing to do with it. Okay, we've got here. So we were talking about my animals at home because they are pedigree. They inherently have more um, recessive, like hip dysplasia. They might both have hip dysplasia. If, if both the parents have, have hip dysplasia, then maybe they do too. We don't know that yet because they're only puppies. All right, so we get lots of inbreeding. Okay, so we're talking about artificial selection, selective breeding. When you are breeding Jack Russells with Jack Russells or Alsatians with Alsatians, there's increased homozygosity. There's a greater chance, remember, a 1 in 4 chance or a 25% chance that the offspring, if parents are carriers, that they, um, their puppies can have hip dysplasia. All right. And they try, they, they're breeding purebred. They're trying to breed, not purebred, but you know, Alsatians with good traits, with other good um, Alsatians with good traits, but mainly they are carriers that hip dysplasia gene. And that's why a lot of dogs end up with problems, and apparently Jackie's too. All right. Okay, so. Right, we did evolution of the dog, yes? And the puppies, and we got to there, and puppies are appealing. Well, even wolf puppies are appealing because mom is enticed to look after them. All about that cute face and big eyes. You know that, eh? Even the babies, us as humans, oh, so cute. Yes. Okay, so then we were talking about this. So, because you're continuously, possibly breeding um, dogs with that recessive trait, it's called inbreeding. So, you need to know about inbreeding and outbreeding. All right? So, the frequency of being homozygous for rare, normally rare recessive disorders increases. Especially if you are selectively breeding and choosing Alsatians because of their other features, that beautiful big nose and the fluffy coat and, you know, wow, but then you might end up having that. And they don't check for that gene, so they might have, there's a higher chance that they have that recessive gene. All right. Okay. Selective breeding of dogs has increased overall genetic drift amongst Dogs. So the more you breed Alsatians, the higher the risk that they have with recessive traits. That's how I'm understanding. Okay. All right. Now this is the bulldog. Anyone have a bulldog? So over, I mean that is that's the original. The skull on the right is from 1800. So they were really selectively breeding dogs to get desired traits. You know the Victorian age. Oh, they want one like this, and they want a fluffy one, and they want one to go and hunt with the horses. So they were already breeding dogs. And then this one's from 1904. Sorry. Hang on. On the right is a skull from 1800, isn't it the other way around? And on the left is one from 1904. Isn't this the breed today? I think it's the wrong way around. Okay, so the New York Times even published an article about the genetic transformation. It is the most extreme example of genetic manipulation in the dog breeding world that results in congenital, inborn, that they can't breed properly and hereditary problems. Bulldog. Okay, very inbred. Look how it's changed. Right. Many pure breeds have problems, like Labradors, also with hip dysplasia and um, golden retrievers. Is it golden? And yeah, Labradors, golden retrievers. Great Danes would be heart problems. My vet has got this huge Great Dane, and they end up with lots of leg problems as well, like arthritis, big dogs, you know, huge legs, but um, spindly little legs and these big bodies. All right, so lots of inherent problems, congenital, born with it. Okay, inbreeding, increased homozygosity, because you keep breeding beautiful Alsatians with Alsatians and Jack Russells with Jack Russells, which we now have. Okay, 
I love him, but oh, I felt no. And you know, different breeds of cattle. And in fact, in South Africa, uh, which one is? I know there's a boer goat, B O E R, the farmer goat, which is so resistant. I just can't remember now what page it is in. It's something. It's on the page of where there's inbreed, um, artificial selection and selective breeding, and that would be at the end of genetics. And they talk about the boer goat. It's so resistant to drought that they 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 have it in you know where um, like uh, uh, the free state in that. They are so resistant to drought. And um, yeah, so they've been bred for those characteristics. We're not talking about inbreeding now, although maybe they're now inbreeding then as well, but we're talking about goats that have been selectively bred for being able to survive in very harsh environments and then still produce more than me. Okay, so damages, disadvantages of artificial selection, I'm just gonna run through. Reduces the chance of the species surviving in times of adversity. Look, I don't know how we're going to bring dogs in here, um, but if they all got hip dysplasia, that's a problem. If they were wild, they wouldn't run fast, okay? Or inbreeding that they can't cope with, with climate change. If they do inbreed those goats, then maybe they won't cope with more climate change. I'm just making up things now. Um, homozygous is recessive, we've talked about, you know, the expression of normally rare diseases, hip dysplasia. Time continuing, breed, 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 breed. Over many generations they've bred, breeders have bred dogs to have certain traits and then people pay lots of money for them, okay? Can cause harm to the animal, decrease their lifespan, especially like Great Danes and that, they don't live very long, all right? It can create organisms that are dangerous to the population, like killer bees. They were once a natural population, they are um, they called Africanized honeybees. They were bred to produce more honey, but they've killed lots of people because they're very aggressive and they will just swarm and, yeah. Okay. And um, the banana, it's got no seeds in there anymore. It's sterile. All right, so you have to go and buy seed and all sorts of things like that. Now, okay, so there's two types of artificial selection. Inbreeding, choosing Alsatians to breed. So what do they do? They rather get Alsatians, you know, you hear of people buying an Alsatian from overseas and bringing it in. Mm -hmm. Or getting cheetahs from North, Af uh, North Africa and bringing them down to South Africa. Or no, not even that. Artificial insemination, collecting sperm. Um, cattle breeders in South Africa, in Irene, there's a sperm bank called Taurus, where um, farmers, they don't want to keep bulls because they are so expensive, but there are some who keep bulls and they donate their sperm to Taurus and it comes in like a little thin tube. I used to get it many years ago when I was still at my previous school and we used to get it, it was come, comes in a big container of liquid nitrogen and then we used to put it under the microscope to see the sperm swim. So what they do, what they do it's like selecting, selecting a baby. It's like, you know, when, when a woman wants to um, use donor sperm because she, you know, she hasn't got a partner and she's getting worried and whatever. So you go through a catalogue, oh, I like that bull, he's got these horns, that nice you know, rump and nice big muscles and whatever, and you artificially inseminate your cows. All right, so that's to try and promote outbreeding. Imagine if you had the same bull on your farm and you bred it with all the cows, then you might get increased homozygosity. That's not good. Okay, all right, so that's my example. So inbreeding, so you've got to relate it to animals and you know, plants and humans as well. So closely related pedigree dogs, but also the Amish community in America. And I know there's something on that later on. And I, I've had a question on that in one of my prelims. This, I can't remember, it's a funny name of the disease. It's in there as well, in the PowerPoint, where they, they end up with so many of their children having this disorder and also polydactyly. But remember, polydactyly was um, also common in that family from Ecuador and they love it because then they play guitar. You see, they don't, but they never got a syndrome, it's just polydactyl. Okay? Um, so, what is the disadvantage of inbreeding? Look at, look at, um, Darwin married his cousin, and then he, three of his children died. Okay? Very early. And he started thinking, why? Oh, the gene, he didn't know about genes, but thing, you know, whatever's too similar, loss of the genetic diversity. So, that brings in that whole thing about. Um, how do we introduce variation? We introduce it by having um, sexual reproduction. 
meiosis with crossing over, um, random assortment of chromosomes, outbreeding, breeding different organisms. So I'm married to a Portuguese man. How different could I be? You know, um, in that, that small little Afrikaner community that came, and there's a nice picture from Holland. There was, there was, um, they were so closely, more closely related that the um, Huntington's Correa gene um, receptor trait became more dominant, more common, not dominant, common. No, it is a, it is a dominant gene, but it became more common. Okay, poor survival rate, short life length, nice word. Reduce hybrid vigor, because if you are hybrid for certain traits, then you're just a carrier. Okay, and then hopefully you don't meet a carrier as well. And you end up. Now my, one, my best friend from school, She's German, and he, she was married to a guy who was British of note, very British. And they had a child, and um, he ended up having corticosteroid something something disorder. He actually, I remember, he passed away at five, because eventually his kidneys fell and his um, adrenal glands to produce aldosterone and other hormones. And it's so rare, but a British person and a German person, how bizarre, I mean, you would think they'd be so different genetically and they ended up having a child with the disorder and a normal child, he's now 20 something. Okay, all right. Decreased resistance to disease, poor, poor health or whatever. Okay, but outbreeding, unrelated individuals, me and my Portuguese husband, all right, distantly related, hybrid offspring. But you know what they say? That it's quite difficult, say one of us needed um, bone marrow or something, it's so difficult to find a match now because there's such a variation in our, you know, in our genes. Okay. But hybrid offspring, carriers, well, we're here just talking about one gene. We've got 20,000 genes. Okay. They're tougher, they're stronger, they're more fertile. Those brood goats that at the moment are so strong. Greater survival. Increased hybrid vigor. Less chance of those recessive traits you know, being present. Um, harmful genes, less likely to be expressed in the offspring. Okay, so hybrid, outbreeding, crossing, selecting different organisms and breeding them, just like the way we get milliolas. Okay, really, we are, I always get muddled up between them, but the cross between a tangerine and a grapefruit. So we've got this hybrid, it's, it's strong fruit, uh, maybe, um, but it's soft and it's juicy and it's easy to peel. It's been selectively bred for those traits, but I don't know if the plant is more um, you know, resistant in the environment to drought, possibly. I'm just making a story now. Humans, marriage between unrelated people. My, this friend, this German friend, her sister married her second cousin, but they didn't know. I don't know how that happened. And their child, their daughter was born with a congenital heart defect. She's not varsity, but she can't do lots of things. She does lots, but she gets tired very quickly and all of that. Okay. Are we happy with inbreeding and outbreeding? Different types of Factors to take into account when you're talking about artificial selection or selective breeding. So the pigeons, you know, you're not going to breed sister with brother. You're going to breed sister with someone. Swap pigeons. Go and get. I remember my uncle used to go and get pigeons from other, you know, people who breed pigeons and mate them to get that hybrid vigor. Okay, cheese forage is lacquer. Hey, I was listening to my husband explain. I don't know if you guys do balloon cards. All right, so how do species form? So Darwin's theory of, of well, hang on, the, 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 how, do, how does speciation take place? It's when new species are made, um, they, they might have common ancestry, all right, and then you get two new species or one species changing into another one, amygenesis, or one common ancestor becoming two new species, cladogenesis. I've never seen them ask you to name those words. So anagenesis, A becomes B, or A, the common ancestor, um, becomes two species because of allopatric speciation, separation by a land mass. Or sympatric speciation, they're still in the same area, but they're reproductively isolated. Is it all coming together now, hey? See, it's a story. All right. So, new species, because they all resemble one another closely, and they all interbreed. So, if new species B, and they resemble each other closely, and they have the same number of chromosomes to get chromosome pairing, to make gametes by meiosis, and um, they can breed and produce fertile offspring, who can also breed and produce fertile offspring, 
That is now a new species that evolved from A, or B evolved from A, but so did C. Okay. All right. I'm enjoying myself. All right. In the same way that dog breeders and farmers change the appearance of animals by carefully breeding artificial selection or selective breeding, synonyms. Darwin proposed that there might also be a mechanism which accomplished the same thing in nature. It just takes longer. And we've, all, you know, we've always thought that um, organisms evolve over thousands or millions of years, or not at all like the coelacanth, but now like those salamanders that I was talking about, they've seen that change happen really quickly. Or with those little, um, those flies and the hawthorns, what are they, what are they called again? Hawthorns and apples, what was the name of the insect? Something water and maggot in it. Yeah, I can't remember now. Okay, how long is this? 50 years. Okay. So the, his, what he thought, what he saw natural selection, um, artificial selection allowed, gave him ideas about how it might happen in nature. Okay. Alright. So we've actually said this. So how did this how does this variation arise? By random mutation, recombination during meiosis, crossing over independent assortment of homologous pairs of chromosomes or in um, metaphase one or you know how the chromosomes line up in metaphase two which chromatid goes into which gamete that's the hardest part to try and write about if they ask you immigration of new organisms from other areas bringing in sperm and semen from cheetahs in the north so that we don't get inbreeding of our cheetahs which is very bad and it's getting better though there's more up in now bringing new allures into a population. That's why males roam. They, you know those males and they roam and they go and take over another tribe and kick the other guy out? They don't know they're introducing variation, but that's actually what happens. Nature somehow instinctively knows that variation and um, outbreeding is better than inbreeding. Somehow that happens. It's amazing. Then I always wonder, wild dogs, alpha male and female. It's one pair for life. They still come from the same parents. Yes, they not the same genes. Yeah, it's a little bit of outbreeding, but not much. Do you know what I mean? Because they're still from the same. Because it's still the parents whose cubs in the The alpha male and female, and their cubs will be the alpha male and female. So isn't that, aren't they related to them? Yeah. Yeah. Because they don't even move around from, what do you call a, a group of? They don't even really move around, do they? Yeah. Okay. They don't migrate to other groups, is what I'm trying to say. All right, we've talked about gene flow, that there might be variation, and we might end up with more, you know, um, brown beetles migrate into another population, and then for whatever reason, brown beetles becoming more common or less common in this population. Okay, I don't, I want another picture. Okay, it's not good. I think it's a bit later. But do you know, do you know what I mean? Like the moth, the second one and the dark one. Which one becomes more common, depending on which one's better adapted to the environment at that time? Lichen covered trees or pollution covered trees? Could adapt also to the Yes, so, okay, so gene flow means they can still breed. They might be different colors, but they're still one species. They can still breed. Genetic drift means which group is more common? I always struggled with those two G's and I used to read and read and read and read. Okay? Genetic drift, which one which is it drifting to? Are there more dark ones because there's more pollution on the trees, or are there more speckled ones because there's more lichen? And in my um, PowerPoint, I talk about the green revolution in England, where they now don't let lots of cars and that into the cities. So therefore you're finding more lichens on trees and then the re-emergence of more light-colored moths. Genetic drift towards light colored ones because of the greening of the cities and the less pollution. Okay. All right, All right so we, we have, mut okay, I know you guys can't see at home, but it just says uh, there's mutations, therefore you get variations in DNA. Mutations drive evolution. Okay, mutations aren't always bad, they, they could um, allow that organism, not remember, we don't talk about organisms evolving but populations 
the big groups, okay? But those mutations could allow that organism to be better adapted to a changing environment. Chromosome mutations, remember aneuploid needs when there's incomplete, um, in unequal separation of um, chromosomes. You know, that's an error of meiosis, but that could be a, that's a bad, you know, that's a, that's a bad outcome. Okay, chromosome mutations happen as a result of errors in meiosis. Well, so we, remember we talked about point mutations. So a, a, a cheetah with a less, a nice straight tail and not a kinked one would be better at running because it can balance. All right, and then you get chromosomal mutations, the big ones like um, Down syndrome and all of that. that could, those can cause issue growth. Okay. I've only read of one that's been solved. Right. So mutations. So it says here, you know, they were, they were white, then you get gray. So mutations cause variation. Maybe that one, white, light gray, dark gray, maybe that one isn't able to survive and pass on its genes because it's not well adapted to a changing environment, like bacteria even. All right. Unfavorable, unfavorable mutations are selected events. They weren't able to survive in the changing environment. Then you get more of these. And then maybe those are also, for whatever reason, some mutation means that they're not adapted to um, a new changing environment. So more of these survive. You see what I mean? It depends what the what, what's happening in the environment, which ones have mutations that allow them to be better, to be better adapted. Not the fact that the environment changes and causes them to, to mutate. That's Lamarck, a quiet characteristic. No, but that can't be like genetic interrupts because that will, would it be genetic interrupts because the dark ones, the dark gray ones are more common? But these guys are gone. So that's not genetic interrupts here, but maybe here, between light gray and dark gray, which one's more common? But if those are gone, it's no longer genetic drift. We've still got black moths and white moths. They still breed, they still want species, but which one's more common at the time? That's genetic drift. Drifting to more dark, or the more position, drifting to more light. Because the light ones won't be preyed on when they're blending with lichen. Dark ones won't be preyed on when they're blending with the sooty branches. I don't think you, you see what I'm trying to say, though. So if they, if they died out, they become, those ones are no longer around. That variant is gone. It's not genetic drift because this, can I say? So now, mm. genetic drift, you get dark and light moths, but the light moths still survive. So they yes. can still carry on breeding and then become normal and then the dark ones grow out and then. Yeah, well, the light ones might be surviving in countryside and the dark ones in um, polluted areas. But if they meet up, they can still breed. Yes. Yeah. Um, now, so if, uh, if the light moths had to completely die, then the genetic drift would stop. Only yes. Yes. And if you only get the dark grey moss, this is light grey, those are dark, you can't really see it. And eventually if you only get dark grey moss, then that one's become extinct or not. But maybe, it depends what they're talking about here. If they're talking about sexually reproducing species, then if they can't even um, breed with the original, then they become a new species. Yeah. Okay. A reminder. Okay, it's, it's kind of just bringing, and I know we said it, but I'm still going to go with the flow. So, Gene mutations, there could be an error in copying of the DNA during DNA replication before cell division, all right? Or exposure to radiation, I mean like x-rays and things, or sunlight on the skin, UV radiation. Or exposure to chemicals like benzene and all these you know, things that um, they use at factories which can actually cause you know, mutations and then cancer, all right? Viruses like human papilloma virus, oh, I didn't even read that, I was just looking there. Human papilloma virus, which we know causes cervical cancer. When I was young, they didn't know that. They thought it was just cancer. We now know that there are viruses that cause cancer. All right, so she said here, be careful. If you're asked to name a mutagen, don't be vague and say radiation. Harmful UV radi radiation from the sun if you're out in the sun a lot. Um, X-ray radiation if people work with X-rays a lot. Okay. Um, give a specific type. The same applies to chemicals. Don't just say chemicals. Talk about you know, benzene in factories that could cause um, mutations in DNA or something like that. All right. And that's, can you see how everything's going to tie up in this paper? It's all going to come together. Okay. All right. Second reminder. Only, okay, so if I have a mutation in the DNA on my skin and I end up with some kind of carcinoma, some skin cancer melanoma, 
Do I have, have I passed that on to my children? No, because it wasn't in my egg. It wasn't in the sperm. All right? Okay? But um, it's something that happened during my lifetime. All right? So it has to be germline. Mutations like you are, it has to be germline for it to be passed on. It doesn't just happen in the middle of the of the lifetime. So, mat so in other words, germline mutations, those are the ones in the gametes. Okay? So the first blue-eyed person, there was a, ger um, a, a mutation in both her, her parents' DNA, for whatever reason, and then there was a 25% chance and she ended up being the, blue, the first blue-eyed person. But somatic cell mutation, the mutation in my skin cells or wherever ever else, it's not um, hereditary. Okay. Unless, if it was Dolly, the sheep's mother, and they took her and made Dolly, then she would be different, hey? All right, a third little reminder, mutations can be neutral, they don't affect the survival chance, negatively or positively, like the shape of your ear. I used to have one of these and then I, put my, I couldn't find the member the other day, it's gone. I'm losing my hair, it's going to be cold. Okay, so six, but harmful mutations, only eye colour and whatever as well, having you know, thumbs that hide to extent, those are neutral, but harmful mutations, sickle, sickle cell anemia, it's when the cells become, um, okay, so what we, we know we've got red blood cells and in there is this hemoglobin and hemoglobin picks up oxygen. Now this is in your textbooks but you're not supposed to know about sickle cell anemia because it's actually, I think it's co-dominance. You know like red cross or white or pink. Please don't go and learn that. And I've told you don't learn that. But it's interesting that if the hemoglobin is mutated, some of the cells, not all of them, they're sickle. And then they can't fit through red um, through little capillaries. And the person can get really ill. But in Africa, a parasite that causes sleeping sickness, she has a fish in the sun or something, that parasite, if it's living in those sickle cells, it dies. And then they don't get that. What's that disease? I can't believe I've forgotten. So sometimes it could be helpful. But um, People who've got sickle cell disease could die because of the sickling of these cells and they don't pass through the blood capillaries. But they found that carriers, don't learn this thing. So if they're carriers, then some of these cells are normal and some of them are sickled, and then the, the parasite gets killed and then they don't get. It's going to bug me now. It is sleeping sickness, I think. Aren't people with sickle cell anemia also um, immune to malaria? Is it malaria? So I've got a brain fog now. Why yeah, have I got a brain fog? Please, Chloe, I can't remember now. Yeah, sickle cell anemia, page 131, don't learn it. Uh, sickle cell anemia, there's a... Yeah, no, it's not what you... It's not dominant recessive, it's, it's a codominant. You don't need to know that. Uh, I can't read through this thing. Yeah, it is codominant. And where does it say? Yeah. So they've got quite a few examples about mutations on page 129, 130. And you can definitely go have a look at that. 129, 130. Okay, so people who have sickle cells in their blood may suffer from anemia because they don't have enough normal hemoglobin. Don't you want to move? And maybe get in the way. Are you okay? I'm okay, sorry. All right. Um, their sickle cells, red blood cells, tend to block capillaries and prevent the flow of blood, causing painful joints, strokes, blindness, and damage to internal organs, and may result in death. It's not in the sag. But the heterozygous individuals are usually healthy, and they don't, um, with minor symptoms of, some of their red blood cells are sickle, but enough of them are normal to carry oxygen. So if they have the sickle cell, yeah, it's malaria. Sorry, Chloe, you are right. I just had a brain fog. So if they have the sickle cell trait, they've got a less chance of getting malaria because it's that trypanosome, eh, parasite, that gets transmitted by malaria, by mosquitoes. If it lives in these cells, it dies. Okay. All right, and that's what you learned about in grade 11 last year. So but please, don't go and learn that. It's code on. All right, so, oh, there's others. Um, on page 130, so other mutations, useful mutations. Um, okay, there's just an introduction. 
There are many examples of youth mutations that demonstrate evolution in action. Lactose, in to sorry, lactose tolerance. We shouldn't actually be able to drink milk, milk when we're adults. My, Hannah's now suffering. We think she's got lactose intolerance. So for some reason now, just read, like since last year, November, she says, and she never said anything, but these past few months, I've now put, we've put her on lactose-free milk. For some reason, she gets cramps with anything. Okay? So normally, babies aren't supposed you know, they, they weren't genetically built to actually drink milk throughout their lifetime, but we've become lactose tolerant that we can drink it in our adulthood. So that's a good one. Um, people, there are some women in Africa. They, there's a group of women that have, were um, immune to HIV, even though they were prostitutes. They didn't get HIV, but eventually they did. They, eventually they did. But for a long time, they were immune to the virus, and they did a whole lot of studies on this. All right, and page 150, we have developed many insecticides to kill pests. All right, so um, mutations that make insects Resistant to the effect of the insecticide. Where? The wording here. Oh, okay. So that's good for the insects. So if we kill insects with um, insecticides and they become resistant, it's good for them that they can survive. All right. Not so great for our crops, though. Or they genetically engineering crops to have natural insecticide within them or to taste bad that insects don't eat them. So that's genetic engineering, yeah, which you also did. Okay. Um, we have developed many new antibiotics to kill disease causing bacteria. Mutations also appear regularly in bacterial populations because they reproduce. Remember, we talked about that the other day, about they reproduce so quickly. Therefore, for the bacteria, they could become resistant to the antibiotic, which is great for them, not so great for us. Okay. All right. So those are some examples on page 150. Okay, I'm going to stop this and...